We're using our brains to understand how we use our brains to understand how we use our brains. Very meta, very HTM school. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Taylor from Dementa and welcome once again to HTM School. This is part two of spatial pooling and today we're gonna talk more about the spatial pooling algorithm in HTM. Last episode we talked about the spatial pooler's input space and how when a new spatial pooler is instantiated it randomly sets up its columns to be connected to that input space. Today we're gonna talk about two things. One, how each of these columns is activated by calculating the columns overlap with the input representation in the input space. And secondly, how each of those columns learns to represent specific spatial characteristics of that data that's being encoded in the input space over time. I am going to explicitly skip two concepts that we could talk about. Those are inhibition and boosting. I'm not gonna talk about those because each of them will get their own episodes, so stay tuned for that. So let's look at our first visualization where we have, we're kind of taking off where we, where we left last episode, where I have an input space over here on the left, and I have a spatial pooler's columns over here on the right. And as you can see, I have some interactions set up for this. Um, and each one of these columns in the spatial pooler has a very specific uh, relationship to that input space. So this is just a randomly initialized spatial pooler. It hasn't learned anything yet. And what we're sort of trying to view here is uh, take this example input that we have here, which you can see here's an encoding, uh, similar to the encodings that we've been dealing with earlier. So say this spatial pooler saw this input in the input space. How would it learn? How would the columns learn to represent that input? So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about learning rules. So first off, each one of these columns, as I mouse over them, you can see that its relationship to the input space is entirely different from the next. They all have these uh, random connections to cells in the input space, and they also have an overlap score. So uh, for example, uh, this column has an overlap score of 38 specifically, and that is the number of connected bits. Here, so the green circles are connections that fall within the input encoding, and all of these gray circles that you see are connections that this column has to the input space, but are not connected to any on bits in the encoding itself. So these are falling outside of the encoding of the data. So a bunch, most of the connections are outside of this, this particular encoding. So that's this column's relationship, and uh, the overlap is 38. What I have over here is a ranking of every single column that we have in the spatial pooler, and they are ranked by their overlap score with this particular input encoding. So for this input encoding, here are how all the different columns rank up. So we've got this column uh, that has the most overlap. You can see it right here. It's the one at the top. Well, there's several that have 47 bits of overlap with this input encoding, um, and those are going to be ranked at the top. At some point, we're going to draw a line right here and say these are the active columns. And the way we draw that line is uh, in the spatial pooler parameters. One of the parameters is called number of active columns per inhibition area, and that is 40. In the examples I'm going to show you today, there's only one inhibition area, a global inhibition area. So every column is a neighbor of every other column. That's called global inhibition. I'll talk more about that in a future episode. But we can just assume global inhibition in this, and there's only one neighborhood. So 40 of these columns are going to be active. We're drawing that line right here and saying any columns that are below that line are not winning in this compute cycle. The rest are. You can probably tell uh, there's some um, several other columns that also have the same amount of overlap. There is a t some tiebreaker logic in here that randomly selects columns if there is a bunch that have the same overlap score, uh, but that is just an implementation detail 
So, uh, so let's choose one of these columns, uh, like this one, and I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, there's these dim squares here, and you can also see some sort of dimmer squares in the input space. These cells will never get connections to this particular column because they are not part of its potential pool. In the last episode, I talked about what the potential pool was. Um, but connections will never grow to these spaces simply because there, there's no dendritic segment that goes to that input space. Um, so uh, we're only ever going to see connections um, in these other spaces that aren't dimmed out like that. Uh, so that's what, what that means. Um, so let's talk a little bit about learning. Um, so given a time step and say this is our time step, let's just grab a column, uh, this one right here, and what happens um, as a spatial pooler learns, first of all, none of the columns that are inactive will learn anything. No state changes happen to columns that have not been activated. So the only learning that goes on happens in these 40 columns in this case. These are all going to um, increment and decrement their permanence values based upon how many connect, what connections they have in the input space in this time step. So for example, uh, for this column, all of these connections that are falling within the input space, uh, the permanence values for those connections will be incremented. That means they'll become stronger. So uh, this input falling with over top of those connections increases the permanence of those connections. It's learning those connections. It's something that that column is going to recognize. Um, any connections that fall outside of the input for an activated column, those permanences will be decremented. So if you remember from the previous episodes, connections are uh, calculated simply um, whether they are above a certain threshold, whether the permanence value for that cell is above a certain threshold. So as these permanence values go up and down, connections can be created and destroyed. So as it learns um, from one compute cycle to the next, some of those connections will go away, some of them will appear, some of them will go away and then reappear. It depends all on the input space, um, on the random initialized state of the system, and on uh, uh, what it's learned so far and how strong its connections are. If it sees a lot of input over connections that it's had well established, uh, those are just going to get reinforced and reinforced. Um, so, uh, so that's an overview of how learning works. Um, very simple learning rules. And, and the values for what gets incremented or, or how much things are incremented and decremented are also parameters to the spatial pooler. Synaptic permanence inactive decrement and synaptic permanence connected, that's the threshold. Um, the last one being, uh, where is it? Minimum, no. Synaptic permanence active increment. <laughs> So this is how much the permanence value is incremented when it is being reinforced. This is how much the permanence value is decremented when it is being diminished because there's uh, not input over top of that connection at any time step. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to show you um, another visualization. This is uh, an example of uh, learning versus non-learning in a spatial pooler. So what I've got going on here is the exact same input, which is here on the left, being fed into two different spatial poolers. The random spatial pooler in the center is not learning. So I've essentially just turned off learning. You can easily do that with each compute cycle. You can tell it, do you want to learn or not? If you say yes, then it will do that incrementing and decrementing of permanence values. Otherwise, it just everything stays the same. So this random spatial pooler um, has learned nothing about the input. It's just its initial random state. Now, the learning spatial pooler that we have over here is, uh, is learning at each compute step. So all of its columns are starting to try and conform to uh, recognize spatial aspects of that input space. Um, so I wanted to try and do a little comparison here. Um, after the learning spatial pooler has seen this cycle several times, it should be producing uh, active columns that represent the input better than the random spatial pooler. And you may remember from, uh, a previous, uh, the, from the previous episode, I used a similar visualization um, where I am comparing the current active columns coming out of the spatial pooler 
to every other set of active columns that have come out of it in, uh, for each time step. So using the overlap score, uh, you can uh, decide how similar each of these encodings is. Um, so if we're doing well, we should have it, it, since we have this daily cycle, I'm in the middle of one of these days, it's like 11 a.m., that should be very similar to the middle of previous days that we've seen, as long as the power level is similar. Um, and it does look like that's the case. This is the learning spatial pooler. In the random spatial pooler, it's not so much. There is some similarity between some of the bits, like there's some yellowish bits here, there's a green one right here, but it hasn't really generalized much about this data set, um, whereas the learning spatial pooler has obviously is doing a better job at understanding the data and producing SDRs that match previous SDRs that it has produced when appropriate. So I just let this run ahead a little bit because I wanted to get into one of these peaks. And we're going to inspect one of these columns or several of these columns in the learning spatial pooler. So I'm going to click on one of these columns. And this is going to bring a view up of this entire column's history for all of the data that it has seen so far and what its cellular state is, what the permanence values, the connections it's, it's, I'm most interested in, the connections it has to the input space. So this is column 864, the one I clicked, and we're at time step zero. I've got a little slider up here that I can grab and move back and forth, and I can move forward and backwards in time. And I also have, uh, I'm gonna show you some things that pop up when I jump forward. So first of all, uh, I'm just gonna step forward a little bit in time, for time step two, three, four, and this column is not active at all. You can see our overlap score is only 19. There's not much overlap with this input to the connections that it has to the input at this point. So um, we'll keep moving forward I, and nothing is happening. No state is changing. That's correct. As long as this column is inactive, n its state will not change. So there is no learning happening until this column becomes active. Now I've got this uh, button here. I can jump to the next active time step. So I'm jumping from uh, 19 and I just jumped to 249. So this column did not even become active. Nothing changed until it saw almost 250 pieces of data. And now suddenly it's become active. Now what happened when it became active? Well, quite a bit. Um, it connected to seven of the cells within that input space. So just from this one input that it saw, that was enough to increment the permanence values of this, these seven connections, these cyan circles, so those, those are now connected. This column is now connected to those seven new input bits in the space. And it has disconnected 13 different synapses, and so we have less connections now outside of that input space. And it's gonna be typical that the spatial pooler is going to disconnect more than it connects because it's gonna to learn to represent sort of a smaller area of the spatial space um, and so let's keep jumping ahead to 50. It's active again. We can see it's still connecting more and disconnecting um, all the way to 298. So this column has not really specialized much, maybe because it's, uh, it just doesn't happen to be randomly connected to the, the right cells that the encoding is covering. Now let, let's look at another one and you'll see some of these are very drastically different. Um, so, so here is column 105. I'm going to jump to the first active column or the first activity where this column is active, and that's only time step six. So I can already tell this one's going to get active um, pretty fast. And let's just step through and watch and see how this the connections this column has to the input space changes as I step through. Uh, it becomes fairly evident after a while what portions of the input space this column becomes sensitive to based on the connections. As you can see, it's diminishing connections that are outside of what, what it's looking for, and it's strengthening connections. Obviously, this range here is it's very connected to, this range here it's very connected to. Let's just bump all the way over to the end and see what the, the end state of this is. And, um, and it's sort of interesting to see from the beginning, this is the initial state to the end, it, it all the connections that were destroyed in red and all the connections that were created in cyan here. So um, 
you can tell it's focusing on this area of the space, this area of the space, and there's still some, some few random stuff that it has associations with. Let's see what else we can discover. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this forward a little bit until we get into that trough, because interestingly enough, there's going to be different columns that could represent that data and that trough uh, uh, that are going to be different than, than the ones that are representing data in the peak. So let's grab one of these guys. I might end up grabbing a column that represents data in both. That happens. But So if I go all the way to the end, yeah, so this one... Um, is, is uh, did not grow a whole lot, it disconnected a lot. 126 connections were disconnected here, and it ended up in a state that looks like this. So we can tell it's sensitive to this area earlier on in the input space, this, this area, and it's sensitive down here. So each one of these columns has a completely different area of sensitivity and um, will learn different aspects of the input space. That's how the spatial pooler learns spatial patterns. It, it, it starts developing these columns that are very highly specialized to just certain spatial aspects of the space. Um, and uh, as those learn that space, um, those connections get strengthened and it's looking specifically for certain attributes of the, the space. Now as the spatial pattern changes, again, since this is so such a plastic process and these, these permanence values can go up and down for the whole life cycle of the spatial pooler, as the input pattern changes over time, maybe the data gets encoded a little bit differently, um, then the spatial pooler will learn the new patterns and forget the old patterns as those old connections are decremented. And new connections get created because there's a lot more inputs happening in different parts of the space. So that was a quick overview of how spatial pooler learning works um, with emphasis on how connections are created, how permanence values change. Uh, next episode, we're going to talk about inhibition and probably touch on topology a little bit. Um, this episode was just about global inhibition. That's the example that we used here, and that's a very typical case that, that we use in NewPick. Um, uh, generally, we always do global inhibition, um, but next episode we're going to talk about uh, inhibition, and then eventually we will talk about boosting. Thank you for watching this second Spatial Pooler episode on HTM School. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. It does me a lot of emotional good, and have a wonderful day. See you on some Friday in the future.